So we have a very interesting development today. Casey S. Eric, the attorney representing Monica Real and Ronald Toyer in the case Vic Mignogna versus Funimation LLC, Monica Real, Ronald Toyer, and Jamie Markey. Suddenly, Casey Eric is no longer listed under the roster of professional attorneys representing Kessler Collins or working for Kessler Collins, I should say. It's not so much that he's not under professionals as he's no longer listed on the website at all. I'll be showing you that website in this video. Part of why I'm making this video is to inform you that he's no longer listed there for whatever reason. The second reason why I'm making this video is to see if you can come up with any reasons why he's not listed on the website anymore. I don't know if that's due to the Vic Mignogna situation and how it's been developing, if, if there's been any issues there that Kessler Collins had with KCS Eric's performance. And even if they did, it would seem like that all happened very suddenly. The case hasn't developed too much over the months that's been going on. And I'd imagine terminating him over something that occurred in the last few months with his handling of that case, when it really hasn't even got started yet, would be rather surprising. But perhaps that's the case. I'm not sure. What I am sure of is that there was another lawsuit that Casey Eric was involved with back in January. In this video, we'll take a look at that lawsuit and see if there's any merit in his removal correlating to that lawsuit or maybe something else. Let's take a look. Welcome back. The first thing I want to take a look at is the website for Kessler Collins. Let's hop on over there. Here we go. Kessler Collins, Attorneys at Law. So we take a look under professionals. We got Gary, Joseph, Howard, Anthony, Daniel, Anthony, Brian, Lisa, Philip, Andrea, Tara, Robert, Alexis, Richard, Tom, Janice, Kimberly. But I don't see any listing for KCS Eric. And I know he used to be listed on here. I, I had looked him up previously when he first got announced to be representing Monica and Ron. And let's just make that clear right now, just uh, in case anyone's confused, and maybe no one is. KCS Eric, as far as I understand, is not representing Funimation and Jamie Markey. As a matter of fact, we do know Jamie Markey's attorney. Uh, I forget her name. Uh, I think it was Lisa, actually, but I might be thinking that because wasn't there a Lisa that we just looked at? Yeah, there was a Lisa under the professionals that we just looked at. But I kind of recall Jamie Markey's lawyer being uh, Lisa as well. Now, if I knew I was going to mention Jamie Markey in this video, I would have looked it up previously. Didn't plan on mentioning Markey. Uh, really just focusing on KCS Eric in this video. Should have looked that up beforehand, but oh well. I'm sure someone in the comments will, will get that for us. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. But the point is, KCS Eric's representing, or was, probably still is, I'm not sure, representing Monica and Ron. And when we go to the page of KCS Eric on the website, it says, sorry, the page you requested is not valid. Please confirm the file name and try again or select a different link. I was only able to get to this page through a Google search. Google search took me to this page, but it has been removed from the site itself, it seems, or at least the listing has, and this was KC Eric's. So what exactly happened? I'm not sure, but I mentioned a case from January. Let's take a look at that. So here is part of a write-up from law.com. Full credits to them, of course. My commentary on this. Let's take a look. A Dallas videographer is seeking more than a million dollars in damages from Dallas Bennett Weston, Lahoney & Turner, which I believe is another firm, actually. Let's take a look at that once we finish this segment. In a case stemming from his unsuccessful claims against comedian Steve Harvey, Bennett Weston co-founder J. Michael Weston and former Bennett Weston lawyer Casey Eric. So Casey Eric was working for this firm. Bennett Weston, the write-up alleges, are facing a negligence suit alleging they mishandled a lawsuit Joseph Cooper filed over rights to videos he took of Harvey. So Joseph Cooper is a Dallas videographer who filed a negligence suit against... Bennett Weston lawyer, Casey Eric, and I guess Bennett Weston co-founder, J. Michael Weston as well, for the mishandling of a lawsuit that he filed over rights to a video he took of Harvey. So that firm is right here. Bennett Weston, Lahone Turner, PC. Now I have nothing bad to say about these guys. I know nothing about them and I don't know how this suit turned out unless we find something else in this article. But as far as I understand, at least from my very foggy memory of a few months ago, this was still a pending case. I could be wrong about that, though. Let's continue on with this write-up and take a look. Cooper has further alleged that the defendants 
impromptly advised him to sign a settlement agreement with Harvey that included a waiver of any rights Cooper had to the videotapes he made more than 25 years ago. Defendant's acts led to Cooper's loss of copyright ownership under the terms of the settlement agreement. This loss caused Cooper to suffer significant economic damages, Cooper said in a position he filed, petition he filed December 28th in State District Court in Dallas. Weston, the president of Bennett Weston, declined to comment on Cooper's complaint. Eric, now a partner at Kessler Collins, or is he, in Dallas, could not immediately be reached for comment. So it seems like the case is allegedly mishandled. I assume that Cooper wanted a greater sum for the copyright of the videos he took than he originally had going on, which was why he was trying to sue for it. Uh, but the case was not handled well, at least he alleges, and that's why he's now suing for negligence against his former attorneys. Interesting how that all played out, but we're not done with this just yet. Plaintiff's attorney, Nick Oasey of the Oasey Law Firm of Houston is representing Cooper. So this must be the new law firm that he's going with, at least at the time of this write-up in January 2019. Cooper alleged that because he failed to obtain a declaratory judgment establishing his rights under the Copyright Act, he could not complete a distribution deal for the earlier for the early videotapes of Harvey. He alleged a damages expert found that he potentially lost revenue ranging from $864,396, $864,396 rather. Guys, it's still early. It's like it's like 7:20 in the morning right now. <laughs> Excuse me. For to $4,321,980 for just a limited selection of the videos. Harvey has a TV show and a radio show, and he hosts the game Family Feud. I'm sure everyone knows who Steve Harvey is. Of course, Family Feud, yes. In Cooper vs. Bennett, Weston, Leone, and Turner, Cooper said he, uh, I don't know if that's redacted or something, interesting. He agreed in 1993 to tape and edit videos for Harvey at Dallas Steve Harvey's Comedy House and was paid $2,000 for the work. He alleged that he shot more than 100 hours of footage and... Because he was an independent contractor, the copyright in the footage is invested in Cooper. So I guess that's the big argument. He was paid to do this work, but he decided that the work was worth a lot more than $2,000, it sounds like, and tried to argue that, you know, even though uh, he was paid for the work, the copyright is still his. Interesting. I'm not an attorney. I don't know how that would play out. I do know a bit about copyright, and that seems kind of like a tough one. I don't know. I guess it also depends on the state, of course. A few years after that, Cooper alleged distributors became interested in getting a glimpse into Harvey's formative years as an entertainer via the videotapes, but Harvey did not share the sentiment. Cooper alleged that Harvey and his attorneys repeatedly interfered in his business deals to distribute the tapes. So I'm assuming that was kind of like the original uh, complaint that he had in the original, the original suit, right? Before the alleged mishandlement by the uh, firm with Casey. Cooper finally had enough of Harvey's bullying, his petition said, so he hired Bennett Weston, okay, yep, to seek a declaratory judgment affirming his copyright on the tapes, and Weston and Eric worked on the litigation. So it seems like we're on the right track. Uh, lamentably, defendant's attorney's gross mishandling of Cooper's case became a comedy, Cooper's petition said. He alleged the defendants committed several errors, including the major blunder of bringing a copyright infringement cause of action and a breach of contract claim instead of seeking declaratory judgment. Now, if you're wondering what a declaratory judgment is, let's take a look here at Texas Civil Law. Under Chapter 37 of the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code, a party is entitled to seek a declaratory judgment from a Texas state court to settle and afford relief from uncertainty and insecurity with respect to rights, status, and other legal relations. Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code 3702. Case, cases seeking a declaratory judgment are often filed when a party wants to court to construe its rights and duties under a contract, or to declare that he or she or is not a party with an interest in a will or trust. The court then declares, i.e. clarifies, if a contract is valid, a non-compete clause enforceable, or a will properly established to name a few examples. Strategic uses. Savvy lawyers often use declaratory judgments for other purposes as well. For example, when someone has threatened to sue a client for breach of a contract or violation of the Texas Deceptive Trade Practices Act, the attorney may recommend filing an action for a declaratory judgment that the contract was not breached or a tort was not committed. In order to have first choice of venue for the case, the statutory scheme also provides for attorney's fees in an appropriate case, so adding a cause of action for a declaratory judgment may open up the possibility of a fee award at the end of uh, the case. Now, as you know, I'm not an attorney. 
I don't really have an opinion on this. I don't really understand the benefit of bringing a declaratory judgment cause of action in with the others, uh, aside from the obvious of potentially getting attorney's fees awarded. But as far as I understand, you can go for attorney's fees even without a declaratory judgment. I might be wrong about that, though. But I suppose it never hurts to have an additional cause of action in your case, especially one that might have an extreme level of merit. But again, and I'm not an attorney, so I'd rather not get into the speculation of these various causes of action. And if indeed the case was mishandled, I don't know. I don't know if it was actually mishandled or not. I have no opinion on that. I'm simply sharing the news from this write-up. Just want to make that clear. I don't know if Casey actually mishandled this, if the previous firm did by any means. But let's finish this right up and see if there's any other information we can get out of this. Here's where we left off. I'll recap that part. He alleged the defense committed several errors, including the major blunder of bringing a copyright infringement cause of action and a breach of contract claim instead of seeking the declaratory judgment. Well, the way that article is written is it sounds like he uh, wanted declaratory judgment and not the copyright infringement and breach of contract cause of actions. There, complaints. Interesting. Interesting. Continuing on. The jury did not find in Cooper's favor, his complaint said. He alleged that the defendants imprudently advised him to enter into the settlement, which included a waiver of his rights to appeal and a waiver of any existing rights to the videos. So I can absolutely see why the plaintiff would be upset about that, though. His original suit was because he more or less seemed to have found value in the videotapes in the copyright that wasn't provided in the original contract for the compensation of that sum. I believe it was $2,000. So in signing away his rights to the copyright, I guess I can understand somewhat why he was upset with the handling of that situation. But again, I don't know if that means that the case was actually mishandled. Just because the plaintiff is upset with the results doesn't mean that the attorneys did indeed mishandle the case. By signing the agreement, it continues on, Cooper relinquished his copyright ownership rights under the Copyright Act. Cooper's petition said, OAC could not immediately be reached for comment. And I think that is actually the last of it. We actually have the original plaintiff's petition here, too. Why don't we take a look at that uh, briefly, actually? That'd be pretty cool. Plaintiff's original petition and request for disclosure. Joseph Cooper, plaintiff, against Bennett Weston, Lahone, uh, and Turner PC, J. Michael Weston, and Casius Eric. Discovery control plan, claim for relief parties. I like to scroll down to the uh, facts, though. Let's go over the facts segment. I know we just brushed by that, but let me let me see here. How far down does this go? All right, this is, this is pretty hefty. <laughs> Not not too bad, but still a bit more than I want to read all right now. But let's let's start with the actually start with the damages. That might be interesting. So damages, according to this petition, plaintiff is entitled to each of the following elements of damages: the total amount of economic damages suffered by plaintiff and the loss of his copyright ownership, which we saw what the the alleged amount of is that no light amount that's for sure. Fees and or expenses paid to defendant in all cases where plaintiff was represented by defendants. So. He wants his attorney's fees back when he was represented by the defendants. I mean, I guess that's fair. If he thinks they did a bad job, why not shoot to have reimbursement of that? Uh, attorney's fees and mediator's fees incurred to try and correct defendant's negligence, which I assume is discussing the immediate case here, not the alleged mishandlement of the previous case, but the current case in trying to remedy that. Attorney's fees incurred in this litigation to the extent permitted by law. I would have assumed that was fitted in with the above. Attorney's fees and mediator's fees incurred to try and correct. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, they're just being more specific. I mean, the, the above section C is obviously mentioning mediator's fees as well, which is obviously different than the attorney's fees, depending on if the attorney was involved in mediating. But sometimes you have a mediator. Uh, fairly often you have a mediator that's not the attorney. So it makes sense. Cost of court and any and all damages at law or in equity. So pretty standard stuff. Um, let's see here. All of the above damages exceed the minimum jurids jurisdictional limits of this court. Plaintiff will rely on the evidence and jury or fact finder to determine the reasonable amount of damages. Interest. Plaintiff is entitled to recover all pre-judgment and post-judgment interest, which, hit, which has and will accrue to accordance within the law. Thus, plaintiff hereby seeks recovery of all pre-judgment and post-judgment interest at the maximum interest rate allowed by law. And you have the request for disclosure. And finally, the prayer down there. We'll skip those. Let's scroll back up now to the uh, facts segment here. Okay, facts. Plaintiff Joseph Cooper is a videographer who, uh, who has worked tirelessly throughout his life to grow his small business. Over 25 years ago, Cooper took a chance by agreeing to tape and edit video footage for a then-struggling Dallas comedian named Steve Harvey. <laughs> like how they uh, add that then-struggling part. Cooper worked hundreds of hours over many months for very little compensation. 
As Harvey's popularity began to rise as an actor, comedian, and game show host, so did the value of the tapes created by Cooper so many years ago. So they haven't even gotten into the copyright argument yet, you know, where they want to argue that he retains the copyright despite being contracted for this work. That's the really interesting part, and I, I wish I had more legal knowledge to have an opinion on that. I really, I really don't. Um, so we're just going to have to see what their complaints are and how they allege that, you know, they're entitled to that remedy. Cooper was finally in a position to reap the rewards of the hard labor sown decades earlier as distributors, and the public became interested in getting a glimpse into Harvey's formative years as an entertainer. Harvey did not share the sentiment, however. He and his attorneys repeatedly interfered in Cooper's business deals by sending threatening letters to prospective distributors and even suing Cooper directly in Dallas County District Court in 1998. Whoa, that's interesting. Harvey's suit was ultimately dismissed by the court for want of prosecution. This did not dissuade Harvey from continuing to maliciously undermine Cooper's efforts to license the tapes for distribution. Interesting, interesting. Cooper finally had enough of Harvey's bullying. To that end, Cooper retained the law firm of Bennett, Weston, Lahone, and Turner to seek a declaratory judgment affirming Cooper's copyright ownership of the tapes. This, led counsel, this lead counsel assigned the case were J. Michael Weston and KCS Eric, now the defendants. Well, the defendant attorneys. Um, but they're the defendants in this situation, rather. That's all I'm saying. Okay, um, that's interesting. So, you know, they mentioned how allegedly Cooper had originally wanted a declaratory judgment to be to be sought after, and that's clearly not what he got, at least according to what we've seen so far. Lamentably, defendants' attorneys' gross mishandling of Cooper's case became a comedy. It reached a point that the law firm's constant flubs in federal court garnered, garnered more press attention than the lawsuit itself. The federal judge even refused to consider at least one of Cooper's dispositive filings, dispositive filings because it was so poorly written and failed to conform to the local rules. This court does not reach the substance of Cooper's arguments, however, because Cooper fails to comply with the court's procedural requirements. Beyond the numerous and various legal errors made by defendant attorneys, they committed a major blunder that jeopardized the outcome of the case. They pled a cause of action for copyright infringement when the case should have been pled as a declaratory action to establish that Cooper held the copyright by operation of law. I see. I see. Um, interesting. So they... Okay, let's continue before I, before I talk about that, actually. Let's finish this up. To make matters worse, the infringement claim was dropped during the course of the proceedings, leaving only a tenuous breach of contract claim to go forward on at trial. By that point, the order on Harvey's motion in Lamine had eviscerated all compelling evidence to present to the jury. Not surprisingly, the jury did not find in Cooper's favor. In the process, regrettably, Cooper's attorneys had opened him up for exposure for counterclaims. That would have been barred if they had not brought forth the breach of contract claim and competently prosecuted a declaratory judgment under the Copyright Act. This whole thing, this whole thing sounds like a giant mess. And I'm just going to restate what I said earlier. I wish I had more legal knowledge to have more of an opinion on all of this. On January 26, 2017, following the jury verdict, defendant attorneys imprudently advised Cooper to enter into a settlement agreement with Harvey. The settlement agreement included a waiver of Cooper's right to appeal the jury's verdict and to waive any existing rights to the videotapes. By signing the agreement, Cooper relinquished his copyright ownership rights under the Copyright Act, a right which he held by law up to, at that point. I mean, I don't know if that's true or not. I really don't. They were obviously taking it to court to fight that fact, but they're presenting it as fact here. Uh, the fact is, Cooper did sign this contract, it sounds like, and that is really on him. I mean, if if he really thought that the attorneys were doing such a bad job, and if it was so obvious that they were doing a bad job. For example, they even said, like, you know, they were laughed out of... What, what did they say? I forget. Somewhere up here, they said how... Um, let's see. Let's see. The federal judge even refused to consider at least one of Cooper's depository fines because it was so poorly written and failed to conform to the local rules. Like, if it was that bad, why would he still want to sign a contract um, by the attorneys representing him if he thought they were doing a horrible job? You know what I mean? And... I would imagine he'd be very skeptical of signing that contract, and you should definitely read through the whole thing. Maybe even get a second opinion from a different attorney, a different firm. I don't know. Seems like he kind of mishandled this as well. But I'm not saying he did. It's just an opinion of someone who's not a legal expert. Uh, let's see. By signing the agreement, Cooper relinquished his copyright ownership rights under the Copyright Act, a right which he held by law up to that point. According to the damages expert retained by defendant's attorneys, the potential by defendant attorneys, the potential revenue lost Cooper ranged between $864,396 to $4,321,980 using a damage model based on a limited selection of the tapes. The full catalog would have likely earned even more. Interesting. I mean, I don't know. 
And we're almost done here. The case within the case. In 1993, Cooper produced films and video advertising doing business as close-up video productions. Cooper and Harvey reached an agreement in that Cooper would film Harvey's performance at Steve Harvey's Comedy House. The video would be used to create a reel of footage that would be shown at the club to promote the club and upcoming performances. A video invoice and negotiated check showed that Cooper charged $2,000 to film the footage. The video invoice provided that Cooper would produce videotapes of promotional material for the facility, including interior shots, audience stage performance, and graphics with official logos. The invoice stated that the videotapes would also include names, dates, music, soundtracks, and be looped for a continuous play before, during, and after show performances. The video invoice further provided that the studio reserves the right to use the original tapes and or reproductions for display, publications, or other purposes, and that the original videotapes remain the exclusivity property of the studio. Ooh, well, that's a very important part of the contract. I wish we could see that original contract from all the way back then. That would be really good. If that's true, that's a very important clause. Um, let's, let, let's see here. But Harvey denied signing this video invoice or ever having any written contract with Cooper. However, Harvey didn't dispute that he had a verbal agreement to video his performance at the club and that he had paid Cooper $2,000 to film and edit this footage. This is a very sketchy case so far, in my opinion. Um, you know, it's... It, 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 it could be very obvious that someone would find value. Uh, let me put it this way. You know, you're paid $2,000 to do this job and you find that the person who is the main center of interest for that job years later, many years later, becomes famous. And of course, that footage would, would then for, then uh, be more valuable because Steve Harvey back then, if there really is no like other footage of him, then it has innate value because it's rare footage of a young Steve Harvey before he was successful. But now he's worth all this money, you know, much more famous dude, so that footage would, would go up. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the contract that he should be paid, you know, back then, if they really agreed to 2K, it's really going to fall down, in my opinion, on if that clause was really in there that he retains the copyright even after the footage is done. Uh, interesting stuff, for sure. I, like I said, I don't really know on the legal side of things where where the law would really play out. And I don't know if this, I don't think this case is actually done yet either. So it seems like the law hasn't uh, fully justice fully hasn't been enacted yet either, but I can see the merit on both sides and I can definitely see why, uh, you know, this dude would want more money than he got out of it when the footage would be worth more, but that doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it legal. We'll see how it all plays out. Let's finish this up though. So the video invoice provided that Cooper would, oh, we already got that. We're, we're oh, we're all the way down here actually. Uh, in the end, Cooper filmed Harvey's performances resulting in more than 100 hours of video footage. Cooper filmed the videos with his own cameras. Harvey paid Cooper without providing Cooper with any employee benefits or paying any of Cooper's taxes. I mean, that seems like a weird thing to add there for a contracted job. It is abundantly clear that Cooper was an independent contractor and there is nothing memorializing a work for hire arrangement. Therefore, copyright in the footage is invested in Cooper. If that's true, man, I'm all, I'm all on Cooper's side if that's really the case. But I can see how this is a weird one. Cooper began to market the videos of Harvey's performance in 1998. In October 1998, Harvey's counsel sent a cease and desist letter to Cooper stating that Mr. Harvey has not relinquished any copyright interest to his performances for Joe Cooper's exploitation. On November 8, 1998, Cooper's lawyers at the time, Jasper C. Rowe, responded to this letter asserting, among other things, that Cooper had copyright ownership in this video as a matter of law under the Copyright Act. More specifically, Rowe correctly noted, so that's really where the argument comes in, I guess. Who really owns the copyright? I mean, according to Cooper's... Uh, you know, what we read up here, it alleges that Cooper had a clause in the contract that he more or less retains the copyright. But Harvey isn't saying that that is actually a real contract. You know, he, he denied signing this video invoice or ever having any written contract with Cooper. So Cooper alleges that that's the case in the contract. Harvey denies it, but he does admit that there was a verbal agreement for $2,000. I mean, it would be really helpful if Cooper had that contract. Maybe that's why it's not anywhere to be found because... Well, maybe it doesn't exist. Maybe it does and it just got lost. This is messy, man. Um, more specifically, Roe correctly noted, the U.S. copyright laws changed in 1989 to grant persons creating artistic works like tapes and copyright ownership in the work created by operation of law. This change in the copyright law was made in order to harmonize U.S. copyright law with international copyright law. It is thus clear that Mr. Cooper owns the copyright in over 100 hours of tapes taped at the Steve Harvey Comedy Club in response to your threat to file a lawsuit against Mr. Cooper seeking injustice. In, in injunctive relief, we respond that such an action would be ill-advised since Mr. Cooper is proceeding in conformity with U.S. copyright law. So it was already a messy situation. It got even messier when you start bringing in how the laws may have changed over the years, too. I think we're almost done. In 2012, Cooper entered negotiations with MVB to distribute the first of the five volumes of the videos. Harvey's attorney sent letters to Cooper stating that he did not have the right to use the recording, recorded footage and demanded that Cooper cease and desist from communicating to the public that he was marketing the video. 
Cooper disclosed this dispute with Harvey about his rights to sell the videos to MVD as they were negotiating the distribution contract. NVB, NVD later wrote a letter to Cooper informing Cooper that Harvey's attorneys stated Cooper did not have the right to sell or distribute the tapes, and Harvey would sue if MVD distributed Cooper's footage. Because of Harvey's threats, Cooper was unable to no negotiate an agreement with MVD or anyone else to distribute the videos. The Copyright Act creates copyright ownership interest as a matter of law in the person filming the footage. A work is fixed in a tangible medium of expression when its embodiment in a copy or phono recorded is sufficiently permitted or stable to permit it to be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated for a period more than a transitory duration. All right. What is this? Now it's citing a, a different suit, Ray vs. ESPN Incorporated, quoting 17 U.S.C. 101. Cooper's filming of Harvey's performance is creating an original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium. Ray vs. ESPN Inc. 783 F3. Okay, I'm not going to read all that. <laughs> citing 17 U.S.C. 101, 102A. Filming of professional wrestlers' performances clearly generated an original work of authorship. As a copyright ownership, the Copyright Act granted Cooper the exclusive rights to do and to authorize the reproduction of the copyrighted work. Preparation for derivative works based on the copyrighted works and to distribute the copies of the copyrighted work to the public by sale or other transfer of ownership or by rental, lease, or lending. 17 USCA 204 A West provides that transfer of copyright ownership other than by operation of law is not valid unless an instrument of conveyance or a note of memorandum of the transfer is in writing and signed by the ownership of the rights conveyed or such by owner's duly authorized agent. So they're arguing that he owns the copyright, copyright was never transferred, and he can do whatever he wants with the copyright, and he retains, you know, ownership of the videos. Um, let's see here. Furthermore, 17 USCA 202 West provides ownership of a copyright or any of the exclusive rights under a copyright is distinct from ownership of any material object in which the work is embodied. Transfer of ownership of any material object, including the copyright of the phono recorded in which the work is first fixed, does not of itself convey any rights in the copyrighted work embodied in the object, nor in the absence of any agreement does transfer of ownership of a copyright or any exclusive rights under a copyright convey property rights in any material object. As such, defense attorneys attempts to pursue this matter as a breach of contract was futile because even if Cooper prevailed on the breach of contract claim, that would only establish ownership of the physical tapes and not the copyright itself. A declaratory judgment regarding the copyright ownership would still be needed. However, this distinction seems to have been lost on defendant attorneys, resulting in incorrect advice being given to Cooper to relinquish his rights in the copyright after losing the breach of contract claim. Holy smokes, how much more? Are we almost done? Yeah, we're almost done, actually. Um, wow, okay. So, this this $2,000, uh, apparently this $2,000 job, right, really became a mess of things years later and is still ongoing, it sounds like. What is, what is this? Going on 20-plus uh, years easily? Oh my goodness. His rights in the copyright after losing the breach of contract claim, the applicable law is well established that ownership of a copyright of or of any exclusive rights under a copyright is distinct from ownership of any material object in which work is embodied. Professional Portable X-Ray Inc. So they're citing another case here. Accordingly, well, that's Portable X-Ray Inc. versus Nelson. I should at least uh, say the full thing there, but I'm not going to go into all the numbers. Accordingly, transfer of ownership of any material object, including the copy in which the work is first fixed, does not of itself convey any rights in the copyrighted work embodied in the object. Professional Portable X-Ray Inc. Uh, F Sup. Furthermore, a transfer of copyright ownership is not valid unless an instrument of conveyance or a no. Okay, I'm not. I'm, we're not going to read all this stuff. They're just citing a bunch of cases to try to make their, you know, make, make their claim stronger. We get it. We get it. A declaratory action is establishing Cooper's rights under the Copyright Act would have allowed Cooper to move forward with a distribution deal based on undisputed facts and law. Cooper would have more likely than not prevailed on such an action. All the above allegations are incorporated below for all purposes. Cause of action for negligence by attorney. Okay. Cooper and defendants established an attorney-client relationship. Defendants breached the duty of care that arose in the attorney-client relationship by failing to plead the correct cause of action against Harvey, failing to establish Cooper's copyright ownership under the Copyright Act through a declaratory judgment action. This establishment of Cooper's copyright ownership would have rendered Harvey's counterclaim for misappropriation meritless and advising Cooper to enter into a settlement judgment which included a waiver of Cooper's rights to appeal the jury's verdict and extinguish his rights to ownership of the videotapes. Really, what, what keeps coming back to my mind is, you know, if indeed Cooper's in the right here and the case was indeed mishandled, I, I feel bad for him. I do. But what comes to my mind is if if the attorneys representing him in the original suit were really that bad, um, why did he ever sign the contract? You know, I that, that part's very odd to me. But people make mistakes, I guess. Defendant's acts led to Cooper's loss of copyright ownership under the terms of the settlement agreement. Oh, oh are we done with that, actually? Let's see. 
This loss caused Cooper to suffer significant economic damages, thus Cooper seeks on liquidated damages within the jurisdictional limits of this court. Cooper invokes the right of Hughes and its progeny, which provides that when an attorney com commits malpractice in the prosecution of defense of a claim that resulted in litigation, the statute, statute of limitations on the malpractice claim against the attorney is told until all appeals on the underlying claims are exhausted. Hughes versus Mahoney and Higgins. And, uh, all right, let's clear up the damages and then we're done. Actually, I think we already read the damages. That's the first thing that we read, isn't it? Well, we'll go over that one more time. It's very brief. Plaintiff is entitled to each of the following elements of damages. The total amount of economic damages suffered by plaintiff in the loss of his copyright ownership, fees and or expenses paid to defendant in all cases where plaintiff was represented by defendants, attorney's fees and mediator's fees incurred to try and correct defendant's negligence. So they don't mention mediation uh, except down here, unless I missed it somewhere. I assume that they actually did try to mediate things, in which case it didn't go very well if it still ended up in litigation. Uh, but maybe they're just putting that there to batch it with attorney's fees. I don't know. They probably did have some mediation, I assume. Otherwise, why would they include that? So mediation didn't go well. This whole thing's been a mess. Attorney's fees incurred in this litigation to the extent permitted by law, costs of court, and any and all damages at law or in inequity. Now, I don't want to say without a you know, shadow of a doubt that they indeed had a mediation. I don't know if that's the case. Uh, I'm just assuming based off this, this uh, segment here in section C of 30 under damages. And that's it. That's it. Wow. I did not plan on reading all that this morning, guys. I just woke up a short while ago. If I mispronounced things or butchered that, <laughs> I apologize. But uh, yeah, interesting stuff indeed. I certainly have a better grasp of that case now with Cooper and Eric and the other attorney who I forget their name. Unfortunately, like I said, it's early. Still got my first cup of coffee here. Um, but yeah, let's start wrapping this video up. So I hope you also found this to be rather informative. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you actually made it to the end, round of applause for you. 30 plus minute video, lots of legal talks. Maybe not the most entertaining video, but depending on what you are interested in, it might've been a lot of fun. To be quite honest, I enjoyed making this video. Even though I'm still waking up a bit, this was a uh, interesting start to my morning and I had fun with it. So I hope you enjoyed as well. Now I should mention, YouTube is going through some crazy times right now. If you'd like to do a bit extra to support this channel, consider becoming a backer on Patreon or sending a one-time donation through Streamlabs or PayPal. Links below for all of that. And if you'd like to send a one-time donation, you can put a message in there and I'll read it in a video as well. That'd be pretty cool. But there's other things you can do to help the channel out. Hitting the thumbs up, commenting down below, sharing the video, all of that helps. Indeed it does. And some shout outs for the wonderful people who promoted the last video over on Twitter. And if you promoted it elsewhere, I simply don't know because my system doesn't tell me, but I appreciate it. People who post on Twitter for the video, what are super lawyers and are they super? Shouts out to Random Fandom, Mr. Anime 343, Pot on the Brain, Omni the Astral King, Mashed Up Potatoes, Sun Pan, hashtag I stand with Vic, Abdel Ali, Paragon Langston of Amped Guard, and Mad Eye Maddie. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Again, I hope you enjoyed, and you're more than welcome to join our Discord server if you'd like. Now with over 3K members, link in the description, open to the public. We'd love to see you there, and I'll catch you next time. Dinner.